Okay, good morning, everybody. How are we all doing? Okay. All right, all you folks who are grabbing breakfast at the back, I'm not judging. I've, I've literally been where you are. But find your piece with cake, or your piece of cake, and make your way forward. Please take a seat, and we will get started. Uh, for those who are joining on the live stream, hello, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you happen to be. All right, my name is Laura Bell Main, and I'm going to be your keynote this morning. Uh, can I say, can I get a good morning, please? Oh, you are there. Good. Phew. It's going to be a really long 45 minutes otherwise. All right. So, this is me. Um, I'm not an artist. I'm a security nerd. Um, but I'm a bit of a strange sort of security nerd. I am kind of, I guess, a security optimist. Uh, I think that's a contradiction in and of itself. But uh, hopefully in this talk you'll sort of understand why. You see, I... I'm really, really excited about the future of technology. Like, really excited. We are in an incredible age of innovation. We are building the tools and the software that we are shaping. You know, the stuff that I read about, that I saw in movies when I was younger. Um, how many of you are excited about tech right now? If you're not, plumbing. I suggest plumbing. You're still dealing with other people's waste, but you get paid a little bit more. Um, I'm getting very serious looks and conversations at the back from a sound guy, so hopefully it's all good. Um, now, I don't want the future to look like this. You know, uh, it's a great movie, but I think it's a little bit dystopian for me. But I do want us to find a way to build the technologies we're building right now and to do it in a way that is safe. Because the future is super exciting. Now, look at these. Now, this is the company I would like to work for if I ever have to get a real job. So this is Boston Dynamics. Um, so those of you who saw the really cute announcement from Tesla that they made a robot, yeah, these people were doing it before it was cool, and they're doing it a lot better. Um, now, what I love about this is they have Spot. Now, did any of you have Spot books when you were a kid, or do you have kids and who've read Spot to them? You know, the small puppy who gets lost a lot and doesn't turn up to dinner? This spot is not getting lost. He is going to make sure everyone turns up for dinner. This is a very, very cool bit of tech. I mean, it's terrifying in some ways. Don't overthink it. But this is the future that I dreamt about as a kid, and we're building it now. Raise your hand if you're working for a company that you're like, this is future tech, and I love it. They are hiring. Just saying. Future tech is hiring, too. Now, in this talk, I'm going to do something a bit different. This is a keynote, so I don't get to come and teach you how to do syntax for whatever. My aim is, in 45 minutes, to give you something to think about, to change your worldview a little bit. And to do it, I'm going to trace through my history to kind of get to where the future is going to be in security. And you'll see why in a moment. I have had a bit of a wobbly journey. Raise your hand if you always knew you wanted to be in software development. There's like, probably like four of you in the room. I didn't either. I wanted to be a lawyer. Specifically, I wanted to be Alan McBeal. And before that, I wanted to be Scully from the X-Files. Um, but things kind of happened. And at the grand age of 16, I became a COBOL developer, uh, which is you know, an interesting life choice in the early 2000s. Um, since then, though, I've had a really interesting wobbly journey through technology, and it has given me some incredible views on what technology was cool and emerging at the time, and how that has developed to today. I've done everything from counterterrorism and online harm to writing radiation monitoring software for CERN in Switzerland. I specialized in natural language processing before that was a career path. Again, not a great choice, but you know, we all make mistakes. And now, I work with very fast-moving teams all over the world, about 37 countries at this point, helping them bring security to whatever crazy, adventurous, exciting future tech they're building. And it's really cool. So in this, we're going to go through kind of the potted history of some of the types of software I've built to show you how we used to do it, how we do it now, and why this is going to change how you have to think about security. 
Um, so hopefully by the end of this, you will have a fair idea of how security needs to work for the next 20 years of your career. So let's start off with a bit of real-time radiation monitoring software. So uh, in 2005, I worked in Switzerland. Now, for those who aren't physics nerds, the LHC, Large Hadron Collider, is a big particle accelerator built underneath the French-Swiss border. Um, you spin particles very, very fast and bash them into each other, and physics happens. That's, you know, the very simplified version of that. You can go read about it if it's your thing. Now, I was um, a new graduate software developer at that point. Um, and my challenge, my job there, was to write software that would monitor background radiation in the LHC. So when the particles are spinning really, really fast, sometimes they get a little bit lost and end up where they're not supposed to be. And when there's too many particles, bad things happen. And then if it hit a threshold, my job was to what was called dump the beam. Now, what that really means is send all of those naughty particles into a giant concrete bunker so that Switzerland still exists the next day. So, no pressure. Um, how many of you feel like as a junior, junior Java developer, this was what you would want to do with your time? <laughs> yeah, it was super, super terrifying. Um, now, what did the tech look like back then? Well, it was custom hardware. Any of you working on custom hardware right now? No custom hardware folk in the space. There are still quite a lot of custom... Oh, they are in the back. Hello. Hi, new friends. Uh, it was all custom hardware. There was no libraries. There were no SDKs. This was about the time that the world was mostly written in C, C++ for real-time stuff, but the Java folks were super excited, and they were absolutely positive they could do real-time too. Spoilers, they couldn't, but they spent a lot of time and effort trying. Now, this is a picture of one of the Radmon devices, and there were hundreds of them around that LHC. So, back then, we wrote thousands upon thousands of lines of initially Java, and then later C++, to monitor radiation. And that was very manual. There was no taking something off the shelf for this. This was line by line, bit by bit, built up from scratch. But the solution now is that IoT, the Internet of Things, these connected hardware devices, are everywhere. How many of you have done a project, even if it's just for fun, with IoT? Yeah, it's cool. How many of you are wearing an IoT device right now? So many of you are. Your watches and your fitness trackers. and I even saw that there were Bluetooth socks now. I don't understand that one, because like the middle-aged person in me is like, how do you wash them? But IoT is in literally everything, and it's getting, it's getting to the point now where it's easier to find something with IoT enabled than it is to find something that isn't. Now, to support all this, we have commonly available SDKs. So when you're writing code, you're no longer going, OK, I need to know the exact chipset, and I need to know exactly what I'm working with here, and you're writing specific code for it. You're inheriting somebody else's libraries and frameworks to do it. Great. All of these things are internet connected. What could possibly go wrong? I mean, there's no problem with that, right? Because when we make really cheap consumer electronics with SDKs, and then we just put them all over the internet, everyone updates them regularly, right? Yeah, absolutely. There's no problems there. Now, in fact, it gets a little bit uh, scarier than that. I decided, because in all security situations, if you want to see the extreme example of what's going to happen in this space, you look on AliExpress. So I was like, well, if I was building an LHC today, could I just go and buy one of these off the shelf? Can I buy a radiation monitoring device? Oh, it turns out you can. Great, for $112. Fantastic. So you have a wireless Geiger counter that you bought from the internet, and it can phone home and tell you that there's too much radiation. Is, is this exciting? I think it's exciting. Would you feel safe? I th it feels safe to me, right? What could possibly go wrong? And IoT, like I said, is everywhere. For every device that you write or that you use, there are dozens of others you haven't even encountered yet. It's the biggest growing space that we have in terms of technology. Now, that is an opportunity, but also it's quite scary from a security point of view. I'm going to come back to that. Let's talk about a different type of software first. So 
in 2006, I was doing natural language processing. Now, this is now a boom area. Is anyone employed in AI and machine learning doing NLP stuff at the moment? Yeah. See, you actually have paying jobs in it. This, yeah, this was not a thing. Um, but back in the day, it was. So I had to write some software. My software was to translate English to French and French to English uh, so that it could simulate a conversation between two people. The aim of this was to try and teach somebody French. Now, what I'm trying to say, if you read between the lines, is I was incredibly lonely and didn't have any friends. And so I invented myself a friend to learn French with. Um, but anyway, that aside. So we had to take language, we had to translate, we had to not just do that, but we had to give feedback on what was wrong. So it was quite a complex challenge and I loved it. It was amazing software to build. And it was, again, written in Java because at that point in time, you know, when we look at the timeline in a little bit, you'll see there weren't really that many other options available. It took me 30,000 lines of Java just to get the initial prototype of this working. And it was crude. It had a glorious uh, swing UI. For those who remember the, the lovely Java swing fat client UIs, it was beautiful. Um, but it did the job. If you were to write similar software today, though, you wouldn't have to do the same thing. You wouldn't have to manually go and label the parts of text and figure out the semantic structures in the French language and how they map to English. All of that's been done. In fact, I decided just about two months ago, I was like, well, what if I tried to rebuild this now? How much code would I need to write to translate English to French or to even just map the parts of speech so I could read a sentence and say, hey, right, this is correct or incorrect, grammatically speaking? And it turns out it was depressingly very little code because there are massive amounts of frameworks and libraries available for this now. The people in the room who are paid to do this, I doubt very much you're doing it all from scratch. You're probably using components that already exist. And that's great. It means we can all now build AI and machine learning systems. Fantastic. How many of you want to do this? None, you're like, no, just don't make me. I, you, you can't make me. I love tax. Let's do tax. Um, so this, this depressingly small amount of Python was me reading in all of the language. I had some input files of just some written text, so I wasn't bothering to write them myself anymore. And it was using the NLP module to then process all of that text. This had taken me thousands of lines before. Not that I'm bitter. Obviously not bitter. But great. Now, this is interesting from a security perspective. Because whenever people think about application security, right, they think about, oh, well, my syntax needs to do this. Or I need to encapsulate my input. I need to do this, that, and the other. We have just done 30,000 lines worth of Java in 20 lines, most of which is comments. Now, where's your opportunity on here to start looking at syntax to protect it? How does security work when you simplified something massively complex down to something very, very small? It's quite interesting, really. And when you start taking it further, this is looking at the parts of speech. So this little bit here just gets the keywords out of a large chunk of data. So if you wanted to say, for example, create a glossary of terms, this is all you need. It processes it and it looks for uh, weighted pairings of phrases uh, of certain uh, parts of speech, and then it, it outputs them for you. All it does. But it's not much. Now, it's not a simple task. There's a lot of heavy lifting going on, but we're no longer doing it. And I think for me as a security person, that's been quite illuminating. Now, what's even further from where I began in 2006 is where we're going now with this. So I went looking, I, you know, before I found myself an internet-enabled Geiger counter on AliExpress. Sure, great, fantastic. I don't need to write any code. Now we can do conversational AI without any code. So we've got low-code and no-code solutions where we can just plug together Lego, essentially, and build AI systems that do data processing. If any of you play in the AWS space um, with the Code Whisperer that they've just launched and their entire range of plug-and-play uh, AI modules, we've got similar things happening in the Azure world. 
this isn't just the case now of just get the right library and write some code. You don't even have to go that far. So how do we keep it safe when we didn't write any of it? I mean, there's a bit of an ex existential crisis underneath the surface here of are we still engineers, but we'll skip over that. Um, well, you know, just talk to me later if you want to have that one. So I parked that little crisis I was having. I was like, right, we'll move on. A new type of software, third one, last one. And then we'll think about how this really affects security. So in 2007, I'd moved on from natural language processing because that wasn't a career path. And I decided to go and work for the UK Intelligence Service, specifically GCHQ. And my job was to uh, help with counterterrorism and counter online harm to children. So the challenge that I was solving there was mapping the relationships between people uh, inside online communities. So identifying aliases and fake accounts, spotting the power brokers in an online community. Now, this was 2006. So many of us are old enough to remember. I'm pleased that we're not a particularly young crowd or you're all really tired one way or the other. Um, how many of you remember these? This is a V bulletin forum. Yep, this was what the internet looked like before we all went onto social media. Uh, how many of you ran an instance of this at some point? Yeah, a few of you. There's some really, truly terrible PHP code behind this. Um, but it, it was the core, it was the backbone of online communities in the early 2000s to mid 2000s. And when it came to online harm, you know, when we talk about the dark web and these nefarious communities, what we actually mean is dodgy technologies that have been thrown up on a server somewhere. And so when you were looking at preventing online harm, you were looking at processing data from things like this. So the solution then was to take these massively fragmented data sets that had been exported from forums, from ICQ, from Jabba, from these messaging technologies that we're all very glad are no longer there, and then to do what you had to do back then, which was write some Perl. And you would write the most disgusting Perl that you can imagine. It was mostly regex, and if you could read it the next day, you were incredibly lucky. But it was the only way to do it. Now, raise your hand if you're sat there going, yeah, but it's not, though, is it? Because there's, there's, other, there's other technologies. I want to show you something. Let's look at a timeline, because I think we forget in tech how far we've come and in what order things happened. So vBulletin, the forum that I'm showing you there, was very, very popular in 2000. Um, it actually it was acquired and then sort of went into a slow demise in the, the mid-2000s. But there were so many servers out there at that point of old versions. And it stuck around for a long time. Facebook, when it first launched as a hot or not site for colleges, that was launched in 2004. So we're, we're not at the point in time here where we have any substantial social network. We, we just don't have this concept. We have forums. We have communities that are just about messages. Now, the tools you would normally use to do this now, things like D3, which are built to map relationships between data sets and visualize them, they weren't released for another 10 years. So we had nothing. In fact, if you look at the timeline of languages, I love a good timeline because it puts things into perspective. Find the languages you write in on the timeline. For most of us, the languages that we built our first substantial products in were in that mid-90s through to mid-2000s phase. Some of you will have moved past this now. You know, you're into the goes and the rusts and, and whatnot of the world. But you start to realize how much was done with these older technologies that we now just take for granted. So what's the solution now? So I wouldn't write dodgy Perl now. Do any of you still write Perl? Is there anyone still doing that? We can have a quiet intervention later. If you do need to talk to someone, we're here for you. Um, right now, though, we wouldn't need to do that. We don't need to do that for a number of reasons. I want to give you a very, very pertinent example. So let's talk about Conti. Conti is a ransomware group. Um, now, they were very notable because they were uh, so problematic that the US government raised a $10 million reward uh, in May this year for any information resulting in them tracking down and stopping this group. So they were causing massive harm all across the internet. So we're all familiar with ransomware, right? Lock up your stuff, charge you a ransom to get it back. Hopefully they give it back. But if not, you know, 
it, it's ransomware. So the Conti group is very, very complex. It's much like the old data sets I used to do. It's a big connected network of people talking to each other and doing nefarious things. Now, when uh, this bounty was put out, some interesting things started happening in parallel. So the war in Ukraine started. And the Conti group, at least one of them, publicly said the Conti group stands with Russia. And we will hack anyone who goes against Russia. Now, somebody, we never know, we still don't know who it is, somebody in the Conti group then turned around and said, well, actually, no, that's, that's not how I feel about this. And so they leaked all of the messages from inside the Conti community onto the, the internet. So you had this internal politics that led to this giant splurge of data. And what was released was messages from 2020 to 2022, about 60,000 chat messages split across lots of platforms, things like uh, uh, Rocket Chat, Jabber. So this was not neat data. It was somebody kind of grabbing stuff and just randomly throwing it onto the internet as quickly as they could. Now, back in the day, this would have been some truly hard work, and it would have been some really nasty scripting to get this done. But I want to show you something on our timeline. In 2019, Microsoft uh, open-sourced a piece of threat intelligence software called Mystic. Now, how many of you have used anything from Microsoft's open-source world? Many of you have, even if you don't realize it. They do a lot of open source. And in the security world, it's no different. Mystic is a really cool Python tool that is used to understand fragmented data, particularly communications data, and particularly data that's used in security incidents or events. Now, when I showed you earlier how we've moved on in natural language processing, how we've moved on in radiation monitoring software, it's the same in this. Rather than writing custom Perl, we now have really nice language processors that you can map nodes and edges together to map out incidents, to catalog the assets, the, the items inside a data breach with very little effort at all. In fact, this is a visualization of the Conti ransomware group. This is all of the people that were inside it. Now, what was interesting is it's not just about, oh, it's glowy and lovely. It's, do you see the two much darker dots? Now, even without doing any intelligence work at all, the darker the dot, the more powerful the person. And so just simply using these tools just to visualize it this quickly has given us a shortcut to seeing how we can interact with this data, filter our work, and respond quicker. This tool's incredible. If you haven't done anything in the security space before and you want to play with a tool that is a good bridge between software engineering and security, this is a great one to play with. Go visualize you know, some data set you have that has things like IP addresses or people in it. Now. What does this mean for security, though? Because I started thinking, well, I'm an AppSec person. I've built software for a long time. But then I kind of realized I was the kind of person who liked to press all the buttons at once. And so I was working in a basement, literally. And um, my boss came up to me and he said, yeah, I, I, we like working with you. You're nice and all, but can you stop breaking things? I was like, hmm, OK. It's like, there's a security team. They break things all day long. So I somehow made it from software development into what was later known as penetration testing and red teaming. And then I've kind of come back as a hybrid. I do a bit of both. Now, when I start looking at how technology has changed, I've got a bit of a problem with how we're trying to do security. And I need to walk you through it. The security guidelines that we're given right now are built to reflect the past. They tell us how to avoid the issues we previously had when we were writing 30,000 lines of Java or some dodgy Perl scripts. Raise your hand if you actively do any AppSec in your world. Raise your hand if you know you should, but honestly, you're really not doing anything. I like honest people. Table at the back are honest. Go, go team. Um, our security guidelines are not great. And I'm going to show you exactly how. Now, have a look at this. This is the OWASP top 10. Now, the OWASP project, the Open Web Application Security Project, is a nonprofit organization uh, founded in the early 2000s. And the aim of it is to give guidance um, so we can avoid uh, 
preventable security flaws in our software. Now, what you're seeing here is the first ever OWASP Top 10 in 2003, and the OWASP Top 10 that was released in 2021. Can anyone tell me what's a little bit depressing about those two lists? They're quite similar. So, in fact, a lot of the changes between those lists are just renaming the same thing to something fancier. In 20 years of application security, what we're seeing has not changed. Now, what does that tell us? If we think about any sort of engineering problem, if we've been doing it for 20 years and we still have the same issue, are we winning? Probably not. Our security guidance protect us from the past. And they don't even do that particularly well. Because if they did, we would be seeing less of the same issues. Now, there's an argument here that the issues exist because there's legacy code and legacy code doesn't get updated. And raise your hand if you've got a legacy project that you don't dare touch because it will break and everyone will be sad. Yeah, absolutely. How many of you wrote that legacy project? Yeah, <laughs> salute you. Um, but it's not just legacy, because if it was just legacy, we wouldn't have Internet of Things problems, because they're not like legacy. If it was just legacy, we wouldn't be seeing issues with machine learning and AI systems, because they're not legacy either. But we're seeing data tampering, we're seeing people using the fluid logic pathways in those systems to change the behavior that we see at the end. We're seeing chatbots get turned into fairly predatory and nasty creatures on the internet by changing the data they're given. So if it's not just legacy causing this, but our guidance is always all about the legacy, then we're doing it wrong. We live in a time where we're building incredible software, but the architectural complexity of what we're building is huge. We're not just writing code from scratch anymore. We don't write the network layer. We don't do all of the connections manually. We don't do it anymore. We find a library that does a job. We put it together with some code we already had or another library, and we build something cool. And that's great. How many of us actually want to build everything from scratch anymore? But because of this, we're not building software in the same way that our guidance is expecting it. If you remember that example of Python from natural language processing, where it was 20 lines, giving you guidance that says, well, to mine for SQL injection or for any sort of input issues, then encapsulate your data, is completely useless advice if you have 20 lines of Python that's using three different outsource frameworks that you did not write. So there's a counterpoint, right? So you chose to use a library, so we're supposed to do what? Well, we do due diligence. So we all look at our libraries, right, before we use them? Yeah? Yeah, you all do a big code review, right? The same kind of code review you would do of a peer who's going to submit a pull request to you. Yeah, you totally do that. No, we don't. We check that it does the job, and we go, oh, it's got a few stars. I'm sure it'll be fine. And because we're using this technology in this way, because we're building from the parts that other people have built, we have to change the way we do security. Our developer community is larger than it's ever been. This is a wonderful crowd. Um, you've got people here from all over the US. Um, I'm from New Zealand. We are able to build software wherever we want right now. We can build it quickly and cheaply. There are 30 million software developers in the world right now. That's very exciting. And it grows at a rate of 1.2 million new developers every year. That's cool too, until you start thinking about how big that community really is and how you do anything as, as a solution to a problem when there's that many people. We have non-linear code pathways now. This is one of the reasons I really love AI and machine learning, is in a standard system, you know, if you write a banking system, you write taxation or insurance, if you put in inputs one, two, and three, you've got a defined logic pathway of what's going to happen to that data before it comes out the other side. Because there's a, a fixed pathway, it's deterministic. But in AI and machine learning-based systems, it's intentionally not. 
the pathway that that data will take through your algorithm, through your code, will change dependent on the circumstances of the system. So what data it has seen before, what data you've given it, time of day, all of these things can influence it. So how do you think about threat? How do you think about risk when the pathway is different every time you see the problem? We have continuous availability. When I first started out as a COBOL developer in tax, I had to have availability of 9 a.m. till 5 p.m. Monday to Friday, and that was it. If there was an issue on a Friday night at 7 p.m., you all sort of kind of went, oh, that's Monday's problem, and you went home. And it was wonderful. I missed these days. Um, we don't live like that anymore. Our availability is 24 by 7. It's not just 24 by 7 in our time zone. In some cases, it's 24 by 7 globally. And not only does it need to be available, but it needs to be performant. You know, our attention span for page loading has gone down from, oh, I can cope with it being 10 to 15 seconds of a little spinning disk, to now if it's more than two seconds, we just go look at something else. This is a very different world. And the security controls that we've defined in the past often slowed things down. They got in the way of availability. So how do we reconcile those two? We also have increased regulation. Raise your hand if you have to deal with a regulatory system. I know there's at least some HIPAA in the room. There's some PCI DSS. Um, is regulation a good thing or is it a bad thing? I can't decide, but it's a thing. And there's no real point in knowing if it's good or bad. It just is. When we have regulation, we have rules to follow, which is good. But this can increase complexity. Now we have to justify and we have to articulate things much more differently. So we have different categories of problems that we're trying to solve now. And we're doing it with technologies that haven't been seen before. So this is all going to affect how we do security. For natural language, where are you going to get your corpus from? Who built that? Where does that data set, what has influenced that data set in its lifetime? Can you change the security of a system by adding in more data or by taking it away? Um, I think it's pretty cool, if a little terrifying, that you could influence the security of a system just by showing it data that it hasn't seen before. That's not the same as having to, you know, restructure a code base or, you know, hack someone's account. This is much more subtle. We have pre-trained models. So what have they been trained on? Who impacted those? Who made the decisions of what was good and what was bad? We all have bias that's just wired into us. And that bias translates into those models. So how will that affect the decisions your software makes? And how will that, in turn, affect the safety and security of the people and the data and the systems it impacts? We have no-code and low-code. So people who aren't engineers are building these systems. And I think this is wonderful. But also, it puts a lot of responsibility on those tool chains to do the heavy lifting for us. The fun thing about security is that we all like to think that security is something we can get to later. But when it comes to the users of our system, Security is the thing that they expect is already there. They don't expect to have to ask for it. They just expect that you wrote good software and good software is secure. Um, I think we have to reconcile that. In data science, we have so many complex data sets now. Um, you know, we have data lakes. We have more data than we've ever had in a lifetime. And sometimes, to be honest, the, the security solution to this is just delete your data. Way easier to secure something you don't have. However, we've now got problems in our data sets where we need it for analysis. We need it for our business purposes. But we're having to do things like de-identification so that we don't harm somebody by having personal information in our data set. And then you get into some really hardcore math stuff. So how anonymous is anonymous data? Can you get it back to uh, its full glory, the full power of it? Now, that's interesting, but also scary when you think about how much data is leaked every year. In New, in New Zealand, Australia, we've just had um, health companies with uh, data leaks. Uh, the companies didn't pay the ransom. The data has been leaked online. Now, as a result of that, people are being harmed. So if we are the custodians of data, then 
de-identification and making that data safe to store is not just about encryption. It's about really understanding field by field, table by table, what we need and how pure, how clean that data needs to be. Can we actually tolerate that data not being the original value? Because we don't need it. IoT, you know, we've got now devices for everything, and that's wonderful and terrifying. The thing we have to consider is how long your software lives for. There is software that I wrote 20 years ago that is still in production environments, and that terrifies me. I have a TV in my living room, a television, and the manufacturer of that TV has decided that I should get security updates for two years. That's it. Now, in my house, televisions last for at least 10 years or until my toddler destroys it, whichever happens first. That leaves an eight-year gap, potentially, where I get no security patches. But my TV isn't just a TV anymore, right? It's also a camera and a microphone because it's got Alexa built in and it's got smart apps in it and it's internet connected. But that's okay, right? There's no risk at all to having something sat in your living room that listens to every word you say so that it can show you exactly what you want to watch on YouTube. That, that's fine. And none of you have a device on your pocket right now that if I said, okay, Google, would spring to life and try and help you in some way. When we're looking at the mass commoditization of software, and particularly in IoT, we have to look at how long those devices are going to last for and how we do security through its whole life, not just that initial period where we're just actively developing it. So to do this, it's going to take all of us. Now, I mentioned earlier that there is a, this team, there's 30 million software developers in the world right now. Now, the way we've done security historically is a bit like a Batman comic. Raise your hand if you have a security person in your organization. Raise your hand if you know their name. Oh, some of you are good. Some of you are honest. Um, what we do at the moment is we hire a security specialist. And maybe they were an engineer, maybe they weren't. And what we say is, hey, we're going to build loads of cool stuff. And then when bad things happen, you can save us. Now, what happens in Batman if in Gotham there are 15 murders happening at the same time? Anyone got any ideas? Well, he creates a backlog in Jira, prioritizes them, and then 14 of them get put onto technical debt. It doesn't work, right? It doesn't scale. You can't have a superhero that's going to save you from your security problems. The key to solving a problem like this is the same way it would work in a city. You have to make sure that everyone knows how to stay safe, that everyone is taking steps to protect what matters. So if we've got 30 million software developers in the world right now, and we've only got 4 million cybersecurity specialists across all fields globally, then you don't need a cybersecurity specialist. You need to think of security differently. Right now, when you build code, you consider quality code, most of you, to be performant, to be scalable, to be observable, to be usable. Now, I'm going to challenge you to add a new one to that list. Security isn't a separate thing. It's not the thing you do at the end of your life cycle. It is part of quality code. It is table stakes. So we're going to turn, instead of a population of 30 million that has some security folk that we've met once and they seem nice, to the team of 30 million security-minded software developers. The world isn't anywhere near as mature as we think. Most of us sit here and we're like, well, you know, all these other companies have got it together. They know what they're doing. We see these conference talks from big names like Netflix and Meta and Twitter about security and this, that, and the other. And we go, well, everyone must be like that. But the reality is only 2% of organizations have really got their stuff together. And mostly they're building their own stuff. A few of us, 15%, give or take, are what we're calling explorers. So they're giving it a shot. Raise your hand if you think you're exploring security. You're doing some stuff, but you haven't got it quite cracked yet. 80%, this big category at the bottom, we're at the very, very beginning. Now, if you consider that there's 30 million software developers in the world, 80% of that is a huge number of us that could do a little bit more. Now, I'm not saying give up your job and become a security person. I'm saying do little teeny tiny things that make security better. 
So how can we do this? Well, firstly, we need to remember that all of our software is connected. Our security advice of the past is built around the idea that we built everything. The, the code you write is the code that matters, and that's what you control, and that's where you put your security controls. But that's not the case at all. Your code, your systems are made up of all sorts of things. There's the wider architecture. There's the components you built. There's the components you've taken from other places. And all of these impact each other. It's what we call transitive risk. The risk you inherit from other components that you work with. Now, to give you an example of this, uh, any of you use Heroku as your hosting platform? Or used it for a project in the past? OK, so Heroku is a, a platform as a service offering, now owned by Salesforce. And in April, it had a bit of a bad time. They lost their private keys. And when I say lost, they didn't lose them. Somebody stole them. And Heroku hosts 13 million applications. Now, by compromising Heroku, the platform of the service technology, the attackers were able to get into 13 million applications and see their private data. Now, when you start thinking about the transitive risk you inherit in situations like that, it's huge. Because we're not talking about you know, 13 million hobby apps. Hosted on Heroku is Citrix GoToMeeting. There are DNS providers that host on there. There are medical centers that host on there, clinician software. This is sensitive data. So you need to appreciate and map out the risk from all of the technology you use. Now, in the US at the moment, there's a push for the software bill of materials. Raise your hand if you're already doing that. It's the idea that if you're going to sell software, you should be able to articulate all of the components it's been made of and ensure that all of those components are safe, not just the code that you wrote. This is coming. This is a map of a single package in NPM. So this is Browserify, so just one NPM module. And this is the 200 to 300 plus modules it links to. Now, I'm showing you this just to show you the scale of what I mean about transitive risk. The software you wrote, because it inherits a library, inherits other libraries, and we're all connected. The future of security is understanding that connection and thinking about that as part of what we're doing. This helps us avoid what we call a supply chain attack. So if your application is the most secure application ever built, then an attacker is ruthlessly efficient. They're lazy. Why would they try and attack your super, super secure thing if they could just go and attack some component that you use instead? Because it would be a lot more effective if they can do that, and they can then get into your code base as a trusted source. To protect one of us, we have to protect all of us. To protect your piece of software that you write, we have to protect all pieces of software. And that feels like a huge problem. Like plumbing is starting to feel a little bit more achievable. But it is achievable. And just for the last couple of minutes, I'm just going to give you a couple of things you can think about when you're going back from this. I don't want the takeaway from this to be the typical go hack yourself, you know, SQL injection is fun. We've been telling you that for 20 years. Didn't work. So let's do something differently. If one of us is breached, we are all at risk. So instead of us thinking about this as an isolated problem we deal with, we need to think about it as a community. You have to start understanding your architectural connect uh, connectivity and complexity, your third party integrations. We have to start looking at the entire development community to help with this. We have to prepare for non-linear code pathways, for understanding code that doesn't look like the code we're used to writing. We have to be able to secure disposable technologies, even if they're not going to be around for a very, very long time. There's so much we need to do. So I'm going to kind of leave you with uh, a, a little bit of a food for thought. And this is absolutely not a sales pitch. So please you know, be very, very mindful. I'm being incredibly clear here. The future of secure development doesn't belong to people like me. It belongs to you lot. Because the people who best understand the complexities of the software you're writing and what could possibly go wrong are you. Raise your hand if you've ever sat in your office and thought, how would you rob the place? 
No? A few of you, good. You should absolutely do it. Thinking about it doesn't make you a criminal. It's the doing it part that is the problem. You cannot defend what you haven't thought about attacking. Even just on a physical sense, you're sat in a room here with lots and lots of strangers. You think naturally, instinctively about protecting yourself in these kind of situations. You know, you sit in a crowded restaurant, you're not going to leave your phone on the, the table and walk off to the toilets. You need to start thinking about that in your operating context at work as well. I want you to sit in a room, preferably with pizza or snacks, because that makes everything better. And I want you to get your team together and decide how you would hack your organization. Now, don't get technical. This is not for getting technical. This is about saying, if I did this, if I turned up at this place, if I gave this type of data, here's the things I could do. And by doing that, you're going to free up your team to start really thinking about how security is going to affect you. Not the syntax. It's too late at that point. But the system you've designed and built and what it's built from. Now, I'm going to give you a gift. This is where it is definitely not a sales pitch. I'm not here to sell to you. I'm on a mission. I want to be redundant. Um, I'm quite lazy, fundamentally. Uh, I think that makes a good engineer. Um, I give away free secure development training to every company in the world who wants it. You can scan that. You can go to the website. There's genuinely no credit card, no strings attached. You get essentials courses for as long as you want. You can bring five team members along with you. That's, that's what I'm trying to do in the world. We also provide free training to all new software development graduates in New Zealand and Australia. Um, and we're looking to roll that out in the US in the next year. So if you'd like to talk to me about that, then come find me afterwards. Because to secure the amazing future that we all want to happen, I need every single one of you to start doing security. And that starts today. So thank you so much for your time. Hopefully that um, some of this will be shared memories of the systems you've written once upon a time. And maybe you could go look at the code that you wrote once and how you would do it again today and really start to understand how that changes everything and how securing the future can't be based on securing the past. OK, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your conference. Uh, workshops are in workshoppy type places. And there's food at the back. I don't know. That sounds like logistics-y stuff. Um, OK, bye.